So welcome back to Thrive, your agency resource. My guest today is my friend and what I would call my sister in spirit, Sarah Hawley. She's the founder and CEO of a company called Grow Motely. And what they do is they culture match professionals with growing companies for full-time and part-time remote jobs. Obviously, uh, very, very relevant in today's climate. Sarah, thank you so much for being on the show. You know that I am always, always excited to be in conversation with you. Uh, thanks for having me here, Kelly. It's always good to chat. So um, let's just start out by talking a little bit about Grow Motley and kind of like what the conditions and, and everything were for all of this to kind of come into alignment literally right before the pandemic. Because a lot of people, I would assume, um, who are listening to this just from the introduction, they would think, oh, well, of course, that business uh, emerged out of the pandemic. But actually, it was prior to that it had been in development. So I'd love to hear a little bit um, about that story and just kind of like maybe touch on a little bit of like what you've discovered about yourself as a leader um, with with the, the, the start of this whole company. Yeah, for sure. And it is a, it is a fun story. Um, so I guess I started my entrepreneurial career as um, a financial advisor running financial advice businesses. So very you know, similar in a lot of ways to like a small agency where you have professionals de delivering a professional service and you have support staff and things like that. And most of my companies were 10 to 20, um, like team sizes of 10 to 20. And around, I, I started in 2010 and around 2014, I started feeling like I created a business partly to have more freedom and flexibility and to be more in control of my destiny and all of that. Yet here I am in an office working longer <laughs> hours because, you know, my egos need to get to the office before everybody else and show them how much of a hard worker I was and I stay there until really, <laughs> really late at night. And, you know, travel had always been such a big part of my DNA and was such a high priority in my life. And I was finding I wasn't able to do as much of it as I wanted. And so around 2014, I decided I'm going to turn my companies remote. I want to move to the United States. I'm from Australia, if people couldn't tell. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm going to turn my companies remote so that I can have more freedom and flexibility. And of course, back in 2014, in the world of financial planning, everybody was like, you can't run a remote financial planning company. Right. It's only like a few tech companies that are remote. Um, and I was like, well, you know, the, I love to prove things wrong and all of that. So that was just like a little bit of extra fuel on my fire to see like, yeah, I can do this. So I basically embarked on that journey in 2014 and it was amazing. Like it was, it was really phenomenal to start going down this path of hiring talent in other parts of the world, of turning the company remote, of getting rid of our offices. We went through like maybe about a year of transition where we used co-working spaces and, and different things, but pretty quickly, everybody just loved being remote. It meant we could hire people anywhere in the world. So it made a lot of sense to just go fully remote. Yeah. At that same time, what I was realizing was I want to hire people anywhere in the world. I can, it doesn't really matter to me, but I don't know how to find them. I like, it's all well and good for me to say, oh, I could have a client services person um, or a marketing manager or whatever out of Argentina, but like, how do I find that person in Argentina? Yeah. So I had a couple of other friends who also were turning their companies remote and we decided to form a business that would be a remote recruitment company. So pretty much like a traditional headhunting recruitment sourcing type agency, but purely for remote talent global. And so we built that company, use it as a biz, use it as uh, the, the company that would do all of our own recruitment for our own firms. And we had a few other clients and we had a general manager in there and it kind of grew a little bit, but it was never really like a massive company. It was a side project. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I successfully turned my company remote. I moved to the US. I gathered, gained all this freedom, flexibility. I became a better leader, which I'll talk about in a moment because I feel yeah. like it's like a whole other thing. Right, right, right. Um, it is. <laughs> and then uh, around 2018, I sold my last financial planning company and I was like, I'm, yeah, I'm done with finance. I want to kind of do something else. And along the way, I had bought my business partners out of 
um, the Grow My Team, the remote right. recruitment company, because none of them were very interested in it. They were like, eh, it's not growing very fast. I don't really like it. And for some reason, I just kept being like, oh, I don't want to let it go. I don't know. I feel like there's something here. Yeah. And remote work feels like it's going to be the future. I don't really know how this business fits in, but like, I'm not ready to let it go. So I bought them all out. And in January of 2019, I stepped in full time as CEO to this re remote recruitment company. Um, fast forward about six months, around mid year. And we'd had a team meeting where I was, we were talking about still the same issue that my business faced originally. Grow My Team also had that issue. Like it wasn't that easy to find talent in different parts of the world. They always had to research different job boards in different countries and be posting things up and using different groups on social media. And I just it had this moment It sounds super time like, consuming. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was really time consuming. And if you wanted to get into a new region, you had to research like where do people in that region and that country specifically look for work. Mm -hmm. And it was after that meeting that I, I kind of got off and I was like, that's the problem. Like, that's a problem that we could solve. There's no global remote, uh, no global job board. Um, we have like country specific job boards, but we don't have a global one. And as I started dancing with that idea, I saw that, well, it's not just when you hire a, when you build a global team, it's not just the job board and finding the talent, but it's also paying them and engaging them and contracts and payroll and lots of things. And I started thinking, well, we could build tech that does the whole thing. You post a job, you look for people, you funnel the recruitment process, you make a hire, the platform can take care of the contracts and monthly payroll and all sorts of things. Um, so that was kind of the idea I was dancing with and what ended up becoming Gromotely. End of 2019, I decided to raise a small pre-seed round to build the MVP of this technology. And I ironically closed that round 32% oversubscribed on March 13th, which was oh the Friday yeah, before I, remember. I went into lockdown. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know it was like slightly different in different parts of the world, but it was roughly around that Same. time. And mm -hmm. yeah, and I don't watch the news or anything. So I really didn't know what COVID was and it all came on me really fast. So that Very Monday I was locked down. I was like, what is this all about? And then a week rolls by and two weeks. And then all of a sudden the two week lockdown was extended to a month and two months. And obviously right. now we all know where we're at now, right, right. Um, but pretty quickly I realized, whoa, the entire world just discovered remote work. Right. And intuitively oh, I knew. Gets yeah, chills so it badly. So, <laughs> it was so amazing. Yeah. And intuitively I knew like people aren't going to want to go back because I didn't want to go back. My team never wanted to go back once we went remote. Obviously the conditions of going remote during COVID are a little different. Like usually remote work doesn't look like you're locked in your house with no right, options right. to go outside. But right. I still knew people would be experiencing the benefits of not having to commute not having to do all the things that's required to like get your house in order to leave. Like it's all this little stuff that we were so used to that we didn't think of, but once it's taken away, it's like, oh, well, that was actually a lot that I used to have to do just to go to work every day. Right. Not to mention having to be in a sp physical space with other people for eight or 10 hours a day and like emotionally regulate everything that comes with sharing mm. space with people that's not necessarily your choice of people like you might like them and everything but people have different personal habits people have different you know introverts and extroverts and all this different energy flowing around um, and we never really thought about that that that's what we were asking of our teams to like come into an office and surround themselves with all these other people and all these other things and be able to regulate that and perform at a high level. Right. So I kind of knew that obviously as soon as everybody starts experiencing remote work and being able to be a little bit more in control of how and where and when they work, they're not going to mm -hmm. want to go back. Um, so yeah, <laughs> ever since then, we've been working really hard to build our MVP, which we launched in April of this year. Mm -hmm. We've just closed a seed round um, last weekend, actually, so that we can continue to build our tech team and continue to market and get our product out there. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been an incredible journey. So yeah. much fun. I feel like I was born to do this. I love yeah. being in technology. I love being in this space. I love, like, I'm just so passionate about what remote work brings to the world. Yes. For everybody, it's like freedom and flexibility and all of that, but diversity and inclusion, there's so many benefits there. Like mm -hmm. you can very quickly unpack a lot of unconscious biases that exist when, um, you can hire people all over the world. You can hire people in different parts of even your own country. Right. Um, and I don't know, there's just so many ways in which I've, I've seen firsthand all of that bias has just start to fall away and it does level the playing field for people a lot. Yeah. So um, first of all, congratulations on last weekend, the seed uh, funding. But Thank you. 
so you just kind of touched at the at the trail at the tail end of that like you kind of touched on what we might call um part part of conscious culture right Mm -hmm. consciously creating and hiring um not only hiring but like so there's the hiring aspect of diversity equity inclusion and then there's also like the conscious leadership aspect of being able to support your people value you know like you said their emotional well-being um all of these other things their flexibility um their work-life balance their mental health things along those lines um so what you're actually talking about is conscious culture, right? In this Mm -hmm. remote world. So can you talk a little bit about like what we mean for anyone who might be unfamiliar with that? What do we mean by conscious culture? And can you give um, another example of, you know, from firsthand experience, something Mm -hmm. that you have encountered in one of your own companies? Yeah, I'd like to give a little example of like where I've seen my own unconscious biases like get unpacked sure. um, before I just go into the conscious culture sure, thing. But I great. once I once hired someone remotely with a disability and I didn't know they had a disability mm-hmm. and I didn't find out for a year later and it didn't matter. Mm-hmm. And I really was honest with myself and I'm like, I don't, I can't be sure if that person had walked into my office and I had compared them with whatever other candidates might have been in the pool. I can't be sure what my biases might have made me do. I like to think that I wouldn't have, but like at the same time, I haven't seen a lot of people with this particular disability working in this particular business. Like I didn't even realize that I might've actually been biased. And when I found out, I was like, wow, that's so freaking cool that I got to unpack that without even realizing it. Um, And the other thing is for anyone who likes to travel, you know, every time you travel, I'm sure you experience that kind of unwinding of like, oh, like, everybody's just a person everybody's just the same even if their skin color is different or their background is different or they grew up in a different kind of cultural environment like at our core we all want to be seen heard valued all of that right and I get to experience that every single day in my team because I have team members from all over the world so those are just some of the ways that I think you know it's like a byproduct of hiring remotely and globally that you start to unpack things and make different decisions. And it's really, really beautiful and expansive. Um, To answer your questions about conscious culture and like what I think conscious culture is, I think it really starts with knowing in truth and owning what is the innate culture of our organization. So, and being okay with it. Like, not saying it's not the buzzwords of like a conscious culture is these five things it's flexible it's this it's that like if you're not flexible that's okay if you have a more like rigid structured type of culture brilliant talk about that own that know that that's who you are so it's the authenticity piece what you're saying yes Uh yeah exactly and owning it and knowing it and confidently putting it out there and trusting that that will call in people that also like to operate in that way Mm -hmm. um we are very flexible and fluid and have less structure than what some people would like. A lot of people would not like to work with me because it's a little bit too flowy and there's an element of kind of organized chaos in there. Um, We do have systems and processes, but even that it operates within, as I say, this fluid kind of organized chaos chaos type thing. We have a little bit less hierarchy um, Mm -hmm. and less attachment maybe to titles and things. And that's not good or bad. That just is how we are. That's right. So, and having hierarchy and structure is not good or bad either. It's just a way of being. That's and right. I think consciousness is bringing, so bringing awareness, by its very def- definition is bringing awareness to how we are, right. um, being able to observe it, understand it, not label it as good or bad, and just be able to effectively kind of communicate it and <clears throat> trust that we'll attract in people that, will work in the same way when we are in alignment with who we are as an organization it also becomes very easy to then navigate out of situations that are not in alignment let's say Mm -hmm. we take on Mm -hmm. a part business partner we're doing work with someone and all of a sudden we start to feel like this is not right and then you can start to see well they operate in this way and we operate in that way once again not good or bad it's just creating friction points because there's a little bit too much difference um, between what is each of our central points and then we can just have a really transparent conversation that is not like you're wrong. You should be doing it this way. It's just like, Hey, like I, I observe that you guys work in this way and I observe we work in that way and it's causing a lot of friction points. And what do we think about potentially like moving in a different direction? And you can do that like so gently and so 
um, you know, with respect and with gratitude for whatever has been and kind of move on, whether it's a team member, whether it's a business partnership, like anyone really. Um, so I feel like, yeah, maybe even with a client. Yeah, exactly. With a, totally with a client, like, and I think an unconscious culture is very much like believing that our way is the right way, the only way, and everybody else should just be this way. And like, if they're not, they're wrong. It's a very like resistance. Um, yeah. yeah, a lot of resistance and yeah. this idea that other is bad um, and mm. that there's a negative and a positive or a good and a bad versus just being like, this is our truth and our highest alignment right. and this is how we want to operate and you're not wrong for being different. It's just not working well for us or what have you. Right. Um, and, and I think really like having that awareness and that ownership of who we are as a culture, like not trying to put ourselves forward as something that we're not Mm -hmm. and I think this is pretty much if anyone like as an individual if you go on a journey to do more personal development more healing become a more conscious individual it's exactly the same process it's like letting go of the judgment of self understanding who we really are as individuals being okay with that observing when you know we might be in a trigger or we might be acting in a way that you know we we can see is not in our highest integrity and being curious with ourselves and um, and doing and applying that same logic to others or that same compassion, that same thinking to others. I feel like a conscious culture is kind of bringing that same con- development of consciousness within oneself into the organization. Um, yeah. I also like, for me, I kind of experience the organization as energy in a way where I can see like the color of it and the vibrancy. And I can also feel like, if, if something's off, it's like, there's another like color in that energy ball. And I like to think of it as colors versus like, once again, right or wrong, good or bad. It's just like, oh, if our color of our company is this throbbing green energy ball, and I can see this red or this purple energy over here, like, it's not bad. It's just purple, not green. And, and we need to like, get the purple out because <laughs> it doesn't work so well with what we're trying to do. And I know that's very like, esoteric and stuff, but it's how I kind of um, experience it as well and, and I think there's an element of intuition as well that comes with looking at our organizations with more consciousness and trusting both like data and what the market might be telling us but also like listening to our, ourselves intuitively as the leaders of this organization and letting yeah. our people um, tell us what they're feeling what they're intuiting um, and kind of like comparing that intuition with some data and things like that to make informed decisions. Right. Let's face it, agency life looks very different than ever before. Remote and hybrid teams need better tools to help them communicate and access files, track their time, manage client budgets, and more. If you believe that it's time to streamline things once and for all, Workamajig is the all-in-one agency management platform built to help you do just that. Head over to workamajig.com forward slash thrive to learn more. Back to the show. Um, it's so funny. I'm sitting here like noticing that I have like the the largest smile on my face because you literally <laughs> just dropped like a knowledge bomb. <laughs> <laughs> I love this, this definition and this like way that you embody um, conscious culture and the way that you talk about it. So for me, like kind of the, the, what I pull out of that from like the, either um, definition or like the kind of those little golden nuggets is like, you know, it's not, it's not about adhering to like the, uh, the Brene Brown definition of like conscious culture. Right. I love her, but um, it's not about that. It's about like authenticity. Right. And then there's this Mm -hmm. idea that um, being curious versus having non-binary or sorry, but curious versus having binary thinking like black, Mm -hmm. white, good, bad. Right. Um, um, I'm right, you're wrong type of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's the element of self-awareness mm-hmm. and all of the things that come with self-awareness, right? Um, it's just, uh, and then this last part about intuition, I think mm-hmm. those four elements, um, you know, I've never heard conscious culture kind of defined or talked about exactly like that, but it's, uh, that's why I was smiling because I'm like, it just, it resonates so much. And I don't think that these are um, typically like what you would find if you're Googling, like what is conscious culture online? You're mm-hmm. not going to find it talked about like that. So no, I really appreciate you for that. You always bring like a, a really interesting perspective to those things. Thank um, you. so, and this is why I love talking to you. Um, mm-hmm. 
but so specifically for like the small to mid-sized agencies in particular, mm-hmm. right? I could imagine that as we're talking about remote work, um, you know, there is often this question that comes up, like there is, there is definitely a palpable difference in the dynamic between in-person interaction and remote work, right? Like we can't not talk about that. Mm-hmm. Um, so how do you suggest, um, you know, some ways that, that you can deal with that if you are a small to mid size like marketing, advertising, creative technology agency? Mm-hmm. Uh, well, to go back to your point of like staying in that mindset of openness and curiosity yeah. and no, non-binary thinking, I think it's also important to realize like there's a difference, but neither is good or bad. So I think that's like a really good starting point okay. because there definitely is Fair. rhetoric out there that's like, oh, it's not the same as in person, but said in a way that is like, it's in person not as good better. as right, that's right, right. kind of what, yeah. And right. I, I just think it's, it's not the same is mm-hmm. truth. Um, but is it better or worse? No, it's just different. Um, mm. So yes, I love being in person with people for sure. And my ideal in my company is to bring my entire team together once a year because we are global. So it's obviously a lot more of a um, big deal to bring a whole bunch of people together once a year. Um, that's that's what I want to do. I think that'll add a lot of value. However, there's a lot of advantages of not having to be in the same office all day, every day with people. Right. Um, because I also get to choose every day who I am in presence with. And right now I'm in Montana with my husband, my baby, and a couple that we're really close friends with and their baby. And we're all working and hanging out for a couple of days. And like, I love that I have the sovereignty to choose that, like the the people who I do want to be in presence with Mm. each day, each week, each month. So I think there's also this idea that, working remotely means we're like isolated, which is not it. We're just having some flexibility and choice of who we might want to be spending time with or when we might want to be alone or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, I just, I kind of just wanted to frame that up just to keep people in this open, curious kind of space. Super important. Um, But when it comes to like actual practical things for continuing to maintain and build culture, and I mean, Even in, I've been remote, as I said, since 2014. So it's in some regards, a little bit hard for me to quite remember like that that transition because it was a while ago. Yeah. Um, But one thing I will say to people as well is the culture exists. Culture always exists, whether you are being intentional with it or not, and whether you are remote or in person, there's still a culture. There's something that's going on that's defining who you are. Once again, it's just bringing awareness to it. So thinking that we don't have culture because we're remote is, is incorrect as well. It's just like still being intentional with it. So if you're a business that is transitioning, you once all did come into an office and that same team of people are now adapting to working in a different way. I think there are really interesting ways to translate what you were doing into what you are now doing. So if it was, let's say every Wednesday was pizza lunch day and that's what you guys always did you ordered pizza in the office and sat and had lunch on Wednesdays you can still do that online like Wednesday can be you can block out the calendar and it's social and we all jump on zoom or google meets or whatever we use and everybody gets a grubhub or uber eats voucher or whatever and orders some pizza to their house like you can still do things like that if Friday nights was when we would all go to the bar together or something some companies do that um, you can do 4 p.m. on Fridays. We all jump on Zoom. We stop working and we have a cocktail together and hang out. So like we can translate some right. of the things that we were doing into an online environment. And once again, I'm not saying it's the same um, or it's better or worse. It's just there are ways that if that existed in your culture before, you can carry it forward. Um, and then I can just give some examples of like fun things that yeah, we've totally. done over the years that are for us, we've been fully remote, fully global, especially in my company now, always. So we we didn't have a culture to translate. We just kind of are are who we are. We have, um, so we have one all company meeting a week, which everybody gets on. This is more um, just like my FaceTime with my team as the leader. I want everybody on for one hour a week with cameras on, doesn't matter where you are, if you're in bed, if you're at the hairdresser, I don't care, it's okay. Just t- come come to the meeting, turn your cameras on and let's all um, kind of listen and chat. And there's a few different people who report on different things. And we kind of keep everyone up to speed. That's like really important for me because we work outside of that. We work fully flexibly 
async, which is you work in your own time. And we spend a lot of time talking about having your own individual personal boundaries. Like I don't mind if somebody works best from 6 p.m. to midnight, like that's totally okay. But I also want to be able to work when I work and when I fire something off, it does not mean that you need to reply to me. Like you, I trust you as an adult to reply when you decide is your best time of the day to work. Um, so we work in that very async kind of way. So that one company meeting a week is just something we all commit to, to at least get that FaceTime. We have a social drop-in on Fridays where there's one hour in the calendar um, that everyone can just drop in and say hi. And the only rule is that you're not allowed to talk about work. So that's something that we created. And we actually, I didn't have that in Grow My Team, my previous company, but we created it in Grow Motely because we were a new team that came together fast and we needed a, some time to get social and get to know each other outside right. of work. So we were kind of intentional with that. Mm-hmm. And in that meeting, we would, you know, we, we can have different topics or somebody would ask a question and everybody would just answer it. And I mean, there's lots of, fun things you can do that are not that difficult. You can buy decks of cards, literally, that are like conversation starters. That's yeah, yeah. a really simple way to just be like, okay, you know. Um, so those are some fun things. We had we had a Halloween party last year where everyone came in costume. And that was fun because some people it was like 5 a.m. and they had to get up and like put their costumes on and other people it was like the evening time. But it was really cool. And everyone was just in costume from like here up, <laughs> which was kind of funny as well. And something really awesome that my team did for me, I I had a baby in March and I went on like a month or so of maternity leave. And about two weeks before they called a marketing meeting and I was like, oh, okay, like my marketing manager wants to have a meeting with me. So I thought it was just myself and one person. And I go on to this meeting thinking it's just going to be like you and me sitting here and the whole team are on there. And they're like, surprise, it's your surprise baby shower. And I was like, what? And they had like sent gifts to my husband to bring, he was in on it, to bring in to me uh, one by one as they kind of went around and like said what their gifts were. And, you know, they had done so much. We also did a really fun, we did a secret Santa at Christmas where everybody was given um, one person and then they had to create a gift that could be given in a meeting online. So people like wrote poems for other people. Aww. They made funny little gifts that they could like show with everybody. They, someone did like a card, an oracle card reading, <laughs> you know, like fun stuff. And we spent the whole meeting just like, it wasn't a meeting. We spent the whole party, the event, okay. just going around. Um, and I mean, this team, they love each other. Like yeah. they're really, really good friends. And so those are just some examples of things I've experienced and then things that we do intentionally. Um, and we have really strong culture. Like right now, our happiness score is 9.1 out of 10. It was 9.4 out of 10 last month. I asked my team every single month, how happy are you out of 10? Mm-hmm. Cause I like to keep a pulse on like where we're at and are we in a good place? And if it ever drops below nine, that's when I'm like, all right, like, you know, my oh, wow, that's open. a pretty high standard. Wow. I have a high standard. That's yeah. great. I love that. I yeah, love that. and um, then you I mean, ask. You know, I'm assuming. I'm assuming you ask as a follow up, like, what is the reason that it's not a ten out of ten? And then you kind yeah, of it says, that. Um, how happy are you out of ten? And why did you give that score? And so you know, people can say, I'm happy because I love it here, or you know, this is what's bothering me right now, or what have you. So, um, yeah, that's something I've been doing since 2016 ish, I think. Um, and when I first did it, the score was only about a six. Oh, out of 10 and you know I guess that wasn't terrible but it was above five but it didn't feel good and but this was my step in like I know that I can do better mm-hmm. but what do I how do I do better in every other area of my business I have data I ask I research I understand and I need to do that with my culture as well and mm-hmm. so I started doing that and it really transformed me as a leader I think whenever we kind of turn the spotlight on ourselves and we're willing to ask for feedback or look at ourselves, do those hard things, you know, that's when the growth really happens. And over time, I think I became confidently, I can say I became a really good leader after that, but it was quite some years of looking at all of that feedback and being able to integrate it and process it all. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's great. Wow. This is, I mean, I absolutely have loved this conversation. I think the examples that you've given are really great, um, really actionable, really tangible. Maybe people can kind of see themselves in a lot of these things. And if they had questions about whether you can actually develop a a true culture, a proper culture um, working remotely, I think this kind of answers the question. 
Um, and again, it's not, you know, right or wrong, as you said, we'll leave it with, it's just different. Right. And mm -hmm. so I really, really appreciate your time. I will post, um, links to remotely in the show notes, Sarah, thank you so much for being with me today. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me, Kelly. It's always fun to chat. It was great. This episode has been brought to you by Workamajig, the number one creative agency management software. Show notes at thrive.workamajig.com. Find out how your creative agency can become more productive and more profitable. Schedule your demo at thrive.workamajig.com.